Fauna has also seen unprecedented growth in the United States, and my own preoccupation with this growth is the fear that our genius for efficiency and oversimplification may lead to an adulteration of Sauna's time-honored customs and benefits. Cecil Ellis Hi, this is Julie, and welcome back to the Sauna Trail podcast. Join us in our adventures as we share the story of how our family discovered the world of Finnish sauna. This episode will be a little different than our previous ones. We'll be diving into some of the background of Finnish sauna so that you can better understand what it is. Last week, Christopher shared his experience using a rustic, secluded sauna in Driftless, Wisconsin that was set on the banks of a trout stream. You can check it out to hear more about the sauna spins. In today's episode, it's just Christopher and I again. Uh, How goes it, Christopher? It's going pretty good. I've been furiously digging into the history of sauna, which which I always enjoy. And then we also received our first snow here in Minnesota for this season. So everything is pretty and white outside. Yeah, no more ugly brown grass. That's nice. Yeah, so this this isn't going to be just a history lesson, but I'd like to explain why these right here that you can see on your screen are some of the top-selling saunas on Amazon, and why things like infrared saunas, and you can't see me, I'm doing quote signs, infrared saunas are so popular these days. And why there are so many signs in hotels and gyms that say, no water on the rocks. This is a dry sauna. And I've put together a slideshow to accompany this episode. And it has photos and illustrations of the history of sauna and how it digressed in North America over time or devolved. And you can download that slideshow if you're just listening to our audio podcast on our locals page which is thesaunatrail.locals.com. And we have other resources there. And you can also say hi to us, can ask us questions there. So come on over and and say hi. So let me go ahead and start the slideshow. And for our audio listeners, we'll do our best to describe everything that's on the slideshow. And if you listen on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, um, the chapter markers might have some of these images as we're going through. So at the beginning, we're going to start by defining what sauna is, just very simply. Sauna is the Finnish hot air and vapor bath. If you just had to come up with the most succinct definition, that's what it would be. And most Americans, we we know that word, sauna. Sauna. Yeah. But they may not know how to pronounce it correctly. That's okay. But they think that they understand the concept. The general conception of sauna is as a heated, oversized cedar closet. And so what you end up losing is the bath part of it and the finish part of it. And even a lot of times the vapor or the steam part of it, so that you kind of all we're left with is warm air. So the American conception of of sauna or sauna is is it's pretty much a warm air heated closet. And if th- if that's your idea idea of it, that's okay. That was our idea of it before heading down the sauna trail. But we want to share with you that there's so much more to it. So so honey, Julie, what what did you think? of sauna before we headed down the sauna trail? Well, I think this slide pretty much sums it up. It's just warm air, and it was uncomfortably warm and stifling, and I did not like it at all. Um, You know, I shared a little bit kind of on our first um, episode where I just did not think it was pleasant. You liked it okay, but I did not care for them at all. Yeah. So 
how did it get so distorted from the finished conception? That's, that's what we're going to dive into today. Sauna is an ancient practice. Notice that I didn't say a place or a thing. It's a practice, and that's going to be very important as we describe what we've learned about sauna. I should also make a note that I'm not a historian, so take all of this with a grain of salt. Um, I have a picture here on the screen of a Native American sweat lodge, which is uh, a modern example of that ancient practice. Nobody knows for sure where it started. It probably was originally done in a pit or a tent where you had nomadic peoples that would go around. And like in the Native American sweat lodge, they just heat up a bunch of rocks and they would bring it into this tent and then steam the rocks, presumably. Originally, it was a hack. It was an innovation that had very practical uses for cleaning up. Um, what are some of the like the practical uses that we've run across in our sauna journey so far? Like you mean like bathing? Sure, that could be one. Anything else? Um, I mean, you'll probably hear more about this later, but like I actually did laundry in one at one point because we didn't have a washer and dryer where we were staying. I think we've washed dishes in it because we heated some water in the sauna. Yeah. Uh, Oh, goodness. Um, like when we feel like a cold coming on, we'll jump in there. Or if we're starting to recover, we'll heat it up. Yeah, you can. We've cooked sausages in the sauna. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've cooked sausages. Yeah, we'll wrap them in foil. So we're not putting them right on the rocks or anything like that. But we'll wrap them in foil, throw it on the rocks. Or I think we had some friends who threw it into the f coals. Mm -hmm. They wrapped up food and put it in the coals. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a clean place with hot water and, you know, kind of the ability to cook. It's not great for cooking, but it was a very kind of a Swiss Army knife of practical purposes. Eventually, this sweat bathing practice was brought to the area around what is modern-day Finland and Russia. And as people settled down and became less nomadic, the tent morphed into a log cabin. So the that, that sauna was moved into a log cabin. There's one old account from a guy named Giuseppe Acerbi, and he was an Italian explorer who traveled to Finland in the 1800s, and he encountered the village taking sauna in their log cabin. So I have a picture of that here. It's kind of, it's a rather famous picture, and you can see Giuseppe peeking in the door on the left. On the left, as people are in the sauna, it looks like they're steaming the rocks and climbing up onto this platform in this log cabin. They're all naked. Yep. Yeah, and it was a mix of men and women um, or a family taking it at the same time. So I think this might have been a Savu sauna? Yep. So the original sauna for hundreds and hundreds or thousands of years would have been this savu sauna or smoke sauna. Can you can you describe what that is for people? Yeah, it's so when I first heard it from Christopher about this thing called a savu sauna, like I could not wrap my head around about how what it was. But it's basically a stove where you burn wood. So it's smoked by wood, but around that fire is hundreds and hundreds of pounds of rocks. Like no thousands of pounds of rocks. It's just a large amount of rocks. And then at the bottom is... And you say stove, you don't mean like a metal stove like we use today. Yeah. And I think that's what got me was I couldn't figure out how they had all these rocks. It's not actually a stove. It's like in the ground, like on the ground, they would build this fire. And then around the the area of the fire, they just built stones all around it. So you only had the opening to just start the fire. There was no chimney, so the smoke would fill the entire room, the building, and it would take hours to heat because they had so many rocks to heat, and then it would heat the logs that make up the wall. And because of the smoke, everything turned black, right, because of the smoke. Yeah, in Russia, they have um, 
because I mentioned that it came from kind of the Finland Russia area, kind of evolved quite a bit there. The Russian practice of banya, which is similar to sauna, they call their savu sauna not smoke sauna or not smoke banya. They call it uh, like a black banya. Oh, that's interesting. So then they heat it, and once the rocks and the walls come to temperature and it's the temperature that they want, what they'll do then is they actually air out all of the smoke. They'll open the doors, they'll open the windows, and all of the smoke will go out so you don't have, you know, carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, And then also to, I think, help move smoke out, I think they would throw water on the rocks so then the smoke would continue to clear out so then when people went in, it was clean air. But what was interesting was then the fire went out. So the heat that was there was coming from that those thousands of pounds of rocks from the wood, and that's how they sounded in the Savu sauna. There wasn't actually a fire going at the, at the time that they're in there sounding. Yeah, and so I think we learned about that as we're discovering that, oh, sauna has this history much deeper than the YMCA. And just reading about that old practice, pretty early on, we were intrigued and started looking for one. And uh, it took us a while to to find one. We'll tell you about that in a later episode. Then then our next question that we're going to cover is, how did it come to us in North America? Originally, the Native Americans brought over their sweat lodge, but that didn't have much of a broader cultural impact. Um, It wasn't until the first Finnish immigrants came in the 1600s that the log cabin style sauna arrived in North America. They called it New Sweden Colony. It was on the East Coast in what's New Jersey and Pennsylvania today. And I I checked with a sauna friend of mine named Frank Eld, who's dedicated his life to going around and learning about traditional Finnish log construction. And he said there's no, none of the old buildings left from that new Sweden colony. From the 1600s. From the 1600s. And so that didn't even really have much effect on what we know today. The next major wave of immigration took place in the 1800s as they were having economic issues in Finland. A bunch of immigrants came from Western Finland in a certain place right here on the map, kind of Southwestern Finland. And Maddie Kalps wrote about this and he said up to half of the Finnish immigrants came from this one small area. And they mostly settled in the Great Lakes region and neighboring areas. So here is a map of the United States and showing where the foreign-born Finns were in the 1920s. So that's, a lot of them were Minnesota Yep. and Wisconsin. No, I'm sorry. I do not know my United States map. Minnesota and Michigan. <laughs> and then after that, it looks like um New York? Yep, New York and Washington. Huh. That's interesting. That's interesting that it's Washington. Yep, there were some in Washington, Oregon, California, but the darkest places are Minnesota and Michigan. And then in Minnesota, Michigan, you can see it was even fairly localized there on this map. In Minnesota in the Arrowhead region, Um, up from Duluth on up north through Virginia and the mining areas. There's a lot, there were a lot of Finns that settled there. And then up in the upper peninsula of Michigan, there's several dark black areas there as well. That's such a concentrated area. That's interesting. Yeah. And then there were some areas in Canada as well, Toronto, Thunder Bay, and a a few other areas that little, little smaller towns, but with a lot of Finnish immigrants that arrived there as well. And these immigrants, they brought their sauna practice with them, and it was done in smoke saunas at that time. And then eventually, as the years progressed, it would have moved into wood stoves and then electric heaters. 
And even though the sauna in general has been severely compromised in North America, their practice in these areas remains largely intact and thriving. And that's interesting. You know, I'm I'm a second generation immigrant. I my parents were born in Cambodia, and so and then I was born here in the states, but I never really, being an immigrant from an immigrant family, I never really thought about other immigrants or like the history of immigrants. Like, I think for me, reading about the Finnish immigrants just gave me a really interesting perspective on on what it was like for immigrants in general. So how it usually starts is like there's one or two families that move to an area, which is what happened with my family. My folks moved to Rochester from Cambodia. We were the first Cambodian family in Rochester. And my dad then began sponsoring other Cambodians. So that's why we have a fairly good size population of Cambodians in Rochester was because my dad kind of brought that community here. And I think that's kind of what happens with other immigrants. Like you have a few people that just get settled and then they start bringing their friends and their family. And then all of a sudden you have like these big Somali um, immigrant uh, populations in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and we've got Hmong people in. And you try to, as immigrants, you have to adapt. You, you want to keep what's important to your culture, but also have to be able to adapt to what is available here in the U.S. And so you know, my parents had to decide what do they want to keep that's precious as a part of their culture and what do they want to, what do they have to let go because it's just not feasible to do here. So we eat lots of rice, like that's a staple. And in the early 80s, there were no Asian markets in Rochester. So my family would go to Minneapolis, St. Paul once or twice a month and go shopping for rice and Asian ingredients. And then we would come back home and eat on that for a few weeks. Um, and so for us, it was food. We had to, we had to like find the food. My parents had to find the food that fed them physically and their soul and everything. And I think for the finish, I think that was like sauna for them. Like they had to have sauna. It was so much ingrained into their life and what they did and their practice. And so it was really cool for me to kind of learn about and to see that as an immigrant, to see that happening for other immigrants as well. Did you feel like you could relate to the Finnish American story as you heard immigrant family stories? Yeah, I think I could relate in the sense of it's almost like trying to balance two things in your life. And, you know, it may not be the same things or it may not be the same rituals or practices, but knowing and understanding how that felt, that that struggle, but yet also being thankful for the ability to actually do it, you know, because my parents were fortunate to come to Cambodia as refugees, you know, in the early, very early. Um, and there were some families that didn't get out of Cambodia for 10, 15 years, you know. And so even though it was difficult, there's also such a level of gratitude. And I think I see that as I study, as I read about Finnish immigrants that like, yes, it was difficult, but they had jobs. They could feed their family. They could do these things that they could not do in their home country. Yeah. And you would move to an area where there were people that understood your language. You know, you could have instant community by moving to an area where there were other Cambodians or Finns or Somalis, you know. And oftentimes the language gets lost after a couple of generations. Yep. Which has happened even in your family, but then also, you know, in the UP, some of the old timers might speak Finnish, but unless they're actively teaching in school a few generations later, they don't. Although there's still Finnish names on a lot of the road signs yeah. up there. Yeah. Or a lot of the city names in northern Minnesota or up in the UP. You'll see Finnish towns. So, but there's always the risk, America being such a melting pot, there's always the risk that it could be positive where that cultural practice melts into the culture, 
where Americans all know what a burrito is or a tamal, you know, Mexican tamales. But other cultural practices, there's the risk that it just melts into the culture and melts away, that you lose that practice. Yeah, and and for good or for bad, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, because you see it like, you know, when the Italians first came over, you know, everybody was an immigrant. Italians were immigrants, Germans were immigrants, French, that all at some point, everybody was new. But like you said, as generations go and they adapt and they live and they learn English and they learn American culture and they they learn a new thing and incorporate that into the old thing. And you have you have a choice to have the best of two worlds. And so then, you know, maybe things that I have want to hold in my culture, I've passed on to my children. Hopefully, they will be able to pass that on to their kids. But again, it's also, this isn't like little Cambodia, you know? And so we do have to kind of weave those things together into something beautiful, which I think it can be. Yeah. Well, as someone that's not from an immigrant family, or at least my family immigrated several, several generations ago, where I'm not even sure who it was or where it was (laughs) from, I want to see those cultural practices that, that new peoples bring to us. I want to see it thrive and not get totally lost in the in the melting pot of America. So selfishly, I want to see those rich practices get incorporated and not watered down. So I'm going to switch gears here real quick, and we're going to talk about just the, the word sauna, because for a long time, it wasn't really known by the term sauna. It was the only Finnish word in the English language but originally people would translate it as either a vapor bath or a bathhouse or a steam bath. So they would just say like the Finnish steam bath or vapor bath. So I have a graph right here that shows the English usage of three different terms. So sauna, vapor bath, and steam bath from the 1800s to 2020. So you can see... The green line and the red line, those are steam bath and vapor bath. So vapor bath was fairly popular, and that could have incorporated even things like Turkish hammam or other types of like higher humidity steam baths. And then steam bath really gained quite a bit of popularity from the 1900s even through to about 1980. And then sauna, you can see was not super well known, but it has a huge uptick in the 1960s. That is huge. Yeah, and it reaches the height of its popularity around 2000. Now, I don't know, some of the trailing off towards the end of the graph might just be that we've gone more digital, so it's less books, although this might include digital books too, I'm not sure. So sauna began to enter the American consciousness in the middle of the 20th century, but it didn't take long for it to morph into something radically different. So how did sauna get to us so malformed or so distorted? Here I've got a picture of an original smoke sauna, old school, and then the modern conception. And you can see the two are pretty radically different. So in 1917, Finland declared its independence and became its own country. And they represented themselves pretty well at the Olympics. This was one of the first kind of global introductions of sauna during these games where all the countries together were together. They brought the sauna with them to the sauna village. And then another catalyst was the creation of two national sauna companies. One was called Viking Sauna on the West Coast, and the other was created by a gentleman named Cecil Ellis on the East Coast. So we're going to examine what happened through the lens of one of these companies, Cecil Ellis's company. And if you remember, if you're paying attention, he had the quote at the beginning of this episode. So this quote was found in the foreword of a 1972 edition of a book. 
It was uh, written by H.J. V. Yuri, and he's known as kind of like the godfather of modern sauna. He wrote this book called Sauna, the Finnish Bath, and he was one of the founders of the Finnish Sauna Society in Finland. So there's a picture of the book. So we're going to get into who was this Cecil Ellis guy. There's a picture of him, and he was known as Mr. Sauna. <laughs> That's pretty good. And he was an Englishman who fell in love with a Finn, and it was over in Europe somewhere. I can't remember if it was in Paris that they met or the UK. I think it might have been in France. And eventually they moved to the U.S. during World War II in November of 1939. He was sounding in a remote area of Finland when the war broke out and Russia invaded Finland and he escaped to the U.S. I just imagine him like running out of his sauna with a <laughs> towel on. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's possible. That may have been what happened. There's an article where he recounts that story. We'll put that on our locals page for you to take a look at. It's a, it's a pretty good article. And so he had moved to the U.S. and started his sauna company 10 years later. And originally it was called Finnish Steam Baths. So you can see it doesn't even have sauna in the title. No, it doesn't. So that's 1949. And this, these articles, I'm going to show you a series of articles over time, and you can get an idea of how sauna was covered and kind of what the conception was. So these are pictures from the first article I was able to find on Cecil Ellis. And what things do you notice in these pictures? Like if you didn't know anything about this Finnish steam bath, what would be your takeaways be? Well, the one on the bottom middle is outside and it looks like it's next to a lake, which I would assume was actually a cabin and not a sauna. Um, an interesting thing is seeing children in there. And there's lots of people. Like there's, you know, the top one is men and women. The bottom one looks like maybe it's just men. There's buckets in several of them. And they have branches in their hands, <laughs> like bundles of branches. Yeah, and those bundles of branches are vitas or vastas, pardon my Finnish pronunciation, but they were used as part of the whole process as a way to kind of clean and exfoliate and also provided a nice scent in the sauna. So yeah, the picture it presents is very different than the modern sauna, those ones that you saw on the best-selling Amazon ones or that infrared one that I showed earlier. Or even what I think of at a hotel or a, a gym. I noticed many of those same things that you mentioned very traditional elements of there's a family there as an external building, the washing element, the community being set in nature. And those are all very important aspects of sauna. But this first article, even in this very first article, we start to see an issue. Here it is. The, it was from the Hartford Current in 1950, so one year after his company had gotten started. So when you say first article, what do you mean by that? Like the first article that he was featured in? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because he had just okay. started his company like a few months earlier, I think, okay. in 1949. Got it. I mean, he was probably doing some work in 48 and everything. Sure. But if you notice the title here, Finnish Sauna, Health in a Hot House. So I'm going to keep returning to these themes throughout this episode, but it already mentions it's something healthy. And it's hot, which both of those things are true. But there's two or three aspects that kind of doomed sauna from the beginning. This health was one. And then also Julie had mentioned that people were naked inside of it because it was a bath. And so that was the other one. As Americans, we tend to sexualize things. Anytime there's any skin shown, it, it's very tantalizing, and we start to get kind of the wrong idea. And this very much happened with sauna. It went from like a family practice, like pictures of a family, to a few years later, all the pictures are like pretty much of models in, in towels. And um, the other one is the health focus. 
And this happened before Finnish immigrants got here. We had a long history of like selling health gimmicks. And sauna, as soon as they realized that, oh, this could, this was healthy or it could be seen as healthy, then anything that was hot began to be marketed as a sauna. And it's healthy for you. Yeah. As Americans, we discover red wine is good. So then we make a resveratrol pill. Or if green tea is good, then we have green tea extract and everything. We, we tend to want to take whatever naturally healthy lifestyle thing there is and just distill it down into a pill. Right. We're good at that. Well, we want healthy, but we don't necessarily want to do the work of health. We want health with ease and convenience and without having to change anything. So there was a rapid devolution of sauna where it moved from practice to product. Let me show you the, the original practice in the robust sauna. These are a couple of his early builds. This is at one at a place called Happy Acres. You can see it's kind of a large building and it shows people sauntering out. It held a lot of people. This clearly isn't like a little two-person closet sauna. Yeah, that's a lot of people. It's like clowns coming out of a car. <laughs> and then this was Cecil Ellis's sauna at his place. Is that a natural waterfall right there? No, I think they probably set that up, that oh. waterfall. Oh, that would have been really cool, though. But, I mean, it's a pretty impressive demonstration sauna. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. And then I think you could even go and either for free or to pay very little, you could go sauna there at his place. I'm sure eventually they got overrun and he had to stop doing that. But. <laughs> so this is another, taken from another article about sauna. And one thing to notice is they're already getting things wrong pretty early. They mentioned that the pronunciation is pronounced like Lana. Oh. So sauna. You know, so that error in pronunciation probably came from people reading things and not taking the time to actually learn how it was pronounced. We we say sauna because we have all those words. Our family says sauna because we have all those words in our English language. So why not try and pronounce it correctly? We don't say tortilla or quesadilla or taco. Not that it not that it's wrong if you say those things. It's more about the actual practice than how you pronounce it, but we're kind of language geeks, or at least I am. He is, and then the rest of us eventually caught on. <laughs> and they also mentioned losing a few pounds. So yeah, again, mm. it gets into this territory of, oh, this is healthy. I need to lose a few pounds if, if I could just buy this sauna product. Here's another one. And it says healthy, fountain of youth. And then if you notice, the picture has already changed. Yep. And at the bottom, the caption to this picture says, American beauty enjoys her, enjoys sauna in her Connecticut home. Which is interesting because in the, the other pictures that you showed, the people that were naked were the men. <laughs> there were, I didn't think anybody, that, any of them were women that were nude. I think they're all men that were nude. Well, but and it's already talking about beauty as if like people in the sauna are on display. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't ever sit like that in a sauna. <laughs> yeah, and there's the, I had found a catalog from Viking Sauna um, this past week as I was researching the history. And I mean, it, it almost looks like a Playboy magazine. Wow, that's unfortunate. So here's another article title, Finnish Heat Bath is Adapted to Use in Suburban Dwellings. So we had the, the issue with health, the issue with the sexualization of sauna, but then also the productization or the move indoors really affected sauna. If you mm, take, yep. It's going to be tough to have a 12 by 12 building with a waterfall inside your house. And so the sauna gets shrunk down into this tiny closet that we've referenced as it got moved indoors. And then here's another picture. Oh my goodness, I never look like that. I don't look like that. That looks so uncomfortable. Yeah, and it, it mentions the heat part and then a fad as it took off in the 60s. It was a huge fad. Yeah. 
Now, this is a picture of a few indoor saunas. I mean, one of them's actually pretty oh, big. Yeah, the one on the right. Big and nice. Yep. Yeah. Um, the one on the bottom is starting to get pretty tiny. Looks kind of like a kit sauna. And then they have in the title, it says, Homes Adding Dry Heat Baths. Oh, that's interesting that they put dry heat versus like steam or vapor. Yeah, I think there was some confusion between like a steam room or a Turkish hammam that has like a high humidity. And so to distinguish between that, they would say that, oh, no, a sauna is dry heat. Oh, comparatively. Yeah, and a sauna is comparatively dry heat. The humidity is very low, but sauna it still has steam, a good amount of steam, and it's a bath. So, you know, there's lots of water being splashed everywhere and used inside the sauna. Here is um, also from the Cecil Ellis Company, and I don't know where this was in his progression. Eventually, he sold the company. But you can see it's a Redwood Log Cabin kit, and it's only $500. So it's already getting smaller and cheaper. His original soundies he would sell for like maybe like 2000 to 5000 back in the 50s wow. and 60s. Wow. And for all my sauna geek friends, it mentions UL. It has the UL <laughs> heater back then. And, uh, and you'll notice that the wood was Redwood. These days... Everyone thinks sauna has to be cedar. Yeah. I mean, it smells nice. But they don't even have cedar in Finland. And then you just use what was available. And when sauna first came to the U.S., they used redwood. Oh, I see. So they would have said it has to be built out of redwood. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's a few more news articles. Now it's gotten so small, the sound has gotten so small, this comic has a guy sitting in like a one-person little closet and the rest of the family is waiting to use it. You can't, it can't even be a family thing anymore. Yeah, I would look mad at like her too. <laughs> and then on the right-hand side, it, it's kind of small, kind of hard to see, but this is, I think, sold by the Cecil Ellis Company, you know, quite a bit later on. He may have already sold the company at that point. But it's a little bit, a little fold up portable sauna. Oh, so you can take it with you when you travel? Yeah. Wow. Which it's kind of a cool idea. It is. But it is so far from like a robust sauna. And this became kind of the only conception of sauna. That this is the right. problem is that right. it was just this tiny closet was the only conception. Yeah. And that's kind of my idea of what it was was just small wood. Hot, dry. And then you can see that it's also advertised next to a scale and an, oh, yeah. and an exercise bike. More health. So by 1972, which is when that book was published that he wrote the foreword for, he started to realize that things were going off the rails. This fad of sauna had had grown beyond him there were sears was selling saunas you know everybody was selling them and it, he was starting to be concerned with this practice that he loved so much and that you know that was part of his wife's heritage and so he wrote that forward penned that quote for the forward if you want to read it one more time in the context of like what we've been talking about so the quote is our genius for efficiency and oversimplification may lead to an adulteration of sauna's time-honored customs and benefits. So this was, you said, like in 72? 72, yeah. yeah. So the 60s have already happened. He's seeing the trouble on the horizon. And he was right. That's exactly what happened. By the time we encountered sauna in our growing up, it was we didn't even know it was Finnish. And you didn't even like it. And the thought of it being outside was crazy. Yeah. So the Finnish cultural practice, the way that I picture it, is kind of like a gold mine waiting to be discovered. But the common American expression of it is like a cheap trinket. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good good comparison. I think it's kind of a, a downer of, a, <laughs> of an episode, but I'd like to talk about like how I see the future of sauna. And then like, you know, what are some positives? So sauna trends or waves have come and gone. 
there's a lot of large cedar storage closets that are not used from old saunas that were installed in the 80s. But one of the positive things is that sauna culture did remain alive in those places in Minnesota and Michigan and other small areas where the Finnish immigrant communities are and still are today. Where there was a high percentage of them. Yeah. Yeah. So you can visit those areas and experience, you know, an authentic, good sauna. We're currently in a sauna fad right now in a current wave of like lots of sales and lots of interest. Yeah. But I'm not sure how much of that will be around in 50 years. The way that I kind of think about it is like you can get excited about it and go use it at your gym or go use a mobile sauna that's the popular new place to hang out in your town. But the real metric for if it's the rich cultural practice that's going to take root is are your grandchildren going to be building their own in their backyard (laughs) and using it with their friends? I hope so. What my recommendation for people to take the most advantage of this current sound of popularity wave is to do your homework, to learn as much about it as you can and go as deep as you can and always stay a student. It's easy, like I've run across a lot of people that they discovered sauna three months ago and they've already started a sauna company and now they're a sauna guru. But the cultural practice, even after eight years for us, I, I know that I'm not an expert and there's so much to learn, especially you want to learn from Finnish people and see how they do it. So if you can connect with a Finnish community and sauna with them and learn how they do it, because they'll tell you, oh, it's just simple. You just go and sweat and wash or whatever, you know, but there's all kinds of small details that you learn when you sauna with them. And then once you learn what sauna is, begin to like share it in a community or start a club and bring people over. I don't know. I think I think what you're saying is, um, I mean, I would even broaden it to like other cultures, you know, like I think if somebody was really curious about like what I was bringing to lunch and it smelled like fish sauce, like ask me what it is. Ask me what I'm eating. Tell me that it stinks. I won't be offended, you know, because I think people do want to share those practices that are meaningful to them that are kind of different and Sometimes it can be a little embarrassing. Like I, I don't really bring a lot of food that smells like fish sauce for lunch because it is kind of stinky, but I do eat it at home. And so uh, I think it's staying a student, like you said, and learning um, from the people who have that tradition and have that ritual and seeing it, them carrying it out, I think is can be very meaningful. Yeah. And it's not just like eating the food or even appreciating the food. The fact that people are cooking that same recipe that you made in their own home shows that that is going to continue or that that is passed around. Even a bunch of restaurants don't, doesn't necessarily mean that because once the restaurants go away, then the practice is gone. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we could have a million mobile saunas and saunas and gyms and hotels, but if those go away and people don't have that practice as part of their life, then it just goes away completely. Yeah, and I think the practice part makes it so much more enriching and attractive than just what I used to think of just a wood dry box, but there's so much more to it. Yep. And I have some recommendations for companies, like if a friend was going to come to me and say, hey, I want to start a sauna company. The company angle is really difficult because you can make a lot of money selling those cheap sauna products. So I would recommend to my friend to have a ruthless commitment to the cultural angle, the practice angle of sauna, and to educate, 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 that you couldn't educate your clients too much, the people that are buying the saunas from you or that are using your sauna rentals, and to focus on robust sauna practices, get as many of those cultural aspects as part of your sauna practice. If you sold a sauna kit or a sauna building, like I would gift my clients some vitas so that they could use and instructions on how to use it. And 
as far as the marketing goes, if I was running a company, I would avoid talking about the health aspects and all of my models would be overweight, hairy 50 year old men <laughs> drinking beers. So, <laughs> and then you also need to give people the chance to experience robust finish practice experience multiple rounds of sauna of heat and cold and having some sausage and good company and doing that multiple times that's the beauty of sauna and that's what gets people hooked on it absolutely you know good sauna sells itself that's that's the good thing you don't have to try and convince people just have them use it we've had friends over to use our sauna and then on their drive home they were talking about where they're going to put one in their backyard. <laughs> you know they're hooked when they start doing that. <laughs> so my sauna friends get really excited when there's new articles about sauna or the Google search trends go way up. But I think our growth for lasting sauna cultural practice is going to be slow. It's going to happen person to person. Yeah, the stuff that's really going to stick well will be that. And some promising signs that I've seen in this current sauna wave are that sauna lovers and the sauna curious are connecting online. Yeah. So there's different Facebook groups that have tons of sauna enthusiasts like me and even some Finns or Finnish American people that are part of the groups and can help teach you. And that's good. And then I see a lot of people building their own saunas, which it sounds scary, especially if you don't have a, a lot of skill or experience building things, but it's not as difficult as you think it might be. If we can do it, you can do it. And then um, I'm seeing in the last maybe three, four, five years, more and better choices for heaters. Oh, yeah, that's true. Because I think even when back when we were first discovering it, there weren't a lot of choices. No. And then like the electric heaters maybe had like 20 pounds of rocks, 30 pounds if you're lucky. Yeah. yeah. But we've had family members who have um, gotten some kit saunas that they put in their backyard and they have electric sauna heaters that have three, 300 pounds of rocks. Yeah, 300, maybe 400. Yeah. And then it can control it on their phone. Yeah, I can turn my mom's on with my phone. That's nice. Yeah. I mean, making your fire, you know, doing all the wood and making your fire is a rewarding and meditative practice in and of itself. But it is also nice to be able to turn on a stove from your phone. Absolutely. So in summary, sauna is much more than just warm air. You know, it is that finish hot air and vapor bath. But it's also more than that. It's a social gathering place. They call it a team ba bath, a uh, place where you have weekly gatherings and a uh, place for generations to mingle. It's a place to malt barley or smoke meats. And we haven't done either of those, but we've read about it. And I mean, I would like to try it sometime. That'd be really cool. It's a place to fight illness. Yep. Which we've been fighting illness. So. Yeah. <laughs> recovery from hard work. I think when we were building our sauna, we were always like, we wish we had a sauna to sauna after building our sauna. And it's a place to relax and mentally reset. And it's a great place to engage the senses with heat, cold, fire, smoke, the smell of birch, which is my favorite, oak, pine, tar, resin from the wood walls. And it's a, a ritual of chopping wood and tending to fires and filling water buckets and setting up chairs. And then, obviously, we haven't done this, but it's a hygienic place to give birth and prepare bodies for funerals. So um, Finnish people used to do that um, because saunas were clean, because they were heated to a certain temperature that killed bacteria. Yeah, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that people do that today. No. But if you find yourself in a bind, you know, yeah. and you have a sauna, there you go. You're out in the woods somewhere and you're ready to give birth. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us uh, this week and hearing us share about how we learned about the history of sauna. In the next episode, um, we'll be joined by my mom and my sister-in-law, Clarissa. We'll be talking about using our first log sauna and then 
I'm really excited I'll get to share a wonderful aspect of sauna that I did not expect to experience. Join us in our Locals community. It's free to sign up and you'll get regular updates from us. If you would like to support our podcast, Locals has that option as well. The address is thesaunatrail.locals.com. We appreciate all of our supporters and fellow sauna adventurers. Our podcast can be found on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and other streaming platforms, as well as our website, thesaunatrail.com. New episodes are released every Saturday, which is the traditional Finnish day for sauna, also called Sauna Paiva. We hope to see you on the sauna trail.